So next we have Dr. Arbisman, um, who is, you know, based on based on his CV, um, someone who's really interested in uh, in science and has a lab and does some really cool things with familial melanoma and uh, how how melanoma works biologically. And you, you'd never know it if you saw him in clinic. In clinic, he is so attentive. Mm -hmm. Uh, looks at every detail and patients really feel cared for. And that's sort of the epitome of what, what we'd like to see in our skin cancer specialist. Um, he comes to us from, um, from medical education at the University of Buffalo and then also residency um, just down the street at University Hospitals, but we're so glad to have him at the Cleveland Clinic. He will be presenting Skin Cancer 101, what everybody needs to know. Thanks, Pauline, and thank you, everyone, for being here. And for the organizers, I'm going to awkwardly share my screen. So um, I'm going to talk at the same time. So I think we should be almost there. And um, I'm going to make it full screen so we can enjoy the talk, hopefully. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about... The, the talk will be in two parts. The first part of the conversation will be about sort of the basics of skin cancer, what you may have heard, putting it into context in terms of how I think about skin cancer, primarily basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma. And then the second part of the talk will be about things that you may have heard that may or may not be exactly correct. Um, and we're going to talk about it sort of in a, in, um, a myths section. Um, and so that will be the second part of the talk. Um, let's see. There we go. I'm not going to look at myself talking. So, um, the first question is what is skin cancer? Um, so I think the critical component here is that there are a lot of different types of cells in the skin. Um, and from that, we can develop a lot of different types of skin cancer. And the, the other important thing is that I write there that it is uncontrolled growth. Um, we develop a lot of benign things on our skin. And what happens is that those cells divide and then subsequently stop growing and there'll be variety of different growths on the skin, whether it be a benign mole or a benign seborrheic keratosis, which is a growth that we acquire on our skin as we, as I like to say, gain in wisdom and maturity. Um, but there's a lot of other types of cells that they, they just continue to grow and there's uncontrolled growth. And that yields basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and, and melanoma, along with other rarer types of skin cancer from Dr. Kennedy, Merkel cell carcinoma. And basically any skin cell type can develop into a skin cancer. So a lot of you or your loved ones have had a skin cancer and you may know what your skin cancer looked like, um, but there's a lot of different ways that skin cancer can present. Um, we're going to see from Dr. Vitimo some pictures of how skin cancer can go more significantly. Um, but I like to think of it generally, this is how I describe it to patients, um, a pink bump or a sore that doesn't go away, that's primarily for basal cell carcinoma. Um, for squamous cell carcinoma, we think of it as a red scaly spot. That being said, there's a lot of different ways that these types of skin cancers can present. And so what I would say to you is if you see something that looks new, different, changing or looks different from everything else on your skin, please come in, please get it checked out. Um, other things I mentioned about sort of a sore that doesn't go away, a lot of basal cell carcinomas will more easily bleed when they're rubbed or poked or something of that nature. Um, and that's another sign that we look for or something that is painful. That's a better sign for skin cancer than something that is itchy. Although many of your skin cancers may have been itchy, Unfortunately, there's a lot of also benign growths that can be itchy as well, but pain is definitely a, a stronger sign from the studies that we see. I want you to be looking at your skin um, about once a month, and that will get you familiar with what is on your skin. Um, oftentimes after a skin cancer diagnosis, uh, there's a period of hypervigilance where you're noticing a lot of new things, 
that may have been there, a lot of different things that may also have been there. But as you familiarize yourself with your skin every month, you'll get a sense of what's new or different and what to come in for. You know that you had skin cancer or your relative had skin cancer, but who in general develops skin cancer? Um, as I wrote, anyone can get it. Thankfully, it's extremely rare in children, but it does occur. Um, and it is significantly more common in individuals of European ancestry um, for the major types of skin cancer that we're talking about, basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma. But we'll address that a little bit later about um, people of non-European ancestry, what, what that means. Dr. Von Chain alluded to this. This is the most common cancer in the United States. One in five Americans um, is estimated to develop skin cancer in their lifetime. I imagine in a number of years, that rate will be even higher, um, both because of an aging population, but also because we are seeing um, increases in the rates of skin cancer. Um, this is my one aside to melanoma, which is also near and dear to me, but that also has risen dramatically in the last decades. Um, and the, the statistic that the American Academy of Dermatology has noted is that approximately 9,500 people in the U.S. each day are getting diagnosed with skin cancer. So this slide is probably not a surprise to really anyone here. Um, we talk a lot about the major environmental risk factor being ultraviolet radiation, um, both in the form of sun exposure as well as tanning bed usage, something that we can easily avoid, tanning bed use. Sun exposure we're going to talk about in a second. Um, definitely, we can reduce our risk to develop skin cancer through sun protection. Um, we'll talk about how that may not be the be-all and end-all for every single individual, um, but the one point that I would like to make right now before we talk about sun protection and sort of the nuances there is that I don't want it to be necessarily sun avoidance. Um, there's a lot of activities that can be done outdoors that are beneficial in a variety of ways. And that just means that you can do them, but be smart about being in the sun and how you protect your skin from the sun. For each individual that may, or, that may manifest in different ways, some people burn much more easily than others. Um, and that may require significantly more sunscreen. I still want people to be wearing sunscreen, but we'll talk about those, those details in a second. But I want people to be involved in the daily activities that they like while still being smart about how they are in the sun. So now, sunscreen and sun protection, the most important thing to every dermatologist, basically. Um, what, what, and the, the question that we get asked the most, sort of what type of sunscreen, how should I do it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we want it to be broad spectrum blocking UVA and UVB. Those are two types of light. Um, oftentimes SPF 30 or higher for the vast majority of people should be sufficient. Um, and we want it to be water resistant. The reason being is that most of the activities that we're doing outside, um, either we're sweating or we're in the water. So this is helpful to allow it to, to last longer. At the same point in time, we want you to be reapplying your sunscreen um, every one to two hours um, when you're out for a prolonged period of time. Um, and yes, I, I, I don't want to ignore the fact that there was a study that did show sunscreen was in the blood. We don't really know what that means when it is in the blood, but we do know that sunscreen use, we're going to talk about in, in, in a few minutes, there is a study that shows that it does prevent um, certain types of skin cancer um, when used on a regular basis for particular individuals. The flip side to this is I think that also sun protective clothing is very helpful, doesn't require you to reapply it, doesn't require you to deal with the greasiness. Um, and to my knowledge, they have not found sun protective clothing within the blood. And so I think if there is a concern in that regard, that is an alternative option that can be used um, and, and does quite well for sun protection. So moving on, I'm a dermatologist. You hopefully have a dermatologist. Um, what, what are the critical things that you should be getting from your dermatologist when you're going after a diagnosis of skin cancer? 
So the first thing is I think that you should create a regular appointment schedule with your dermatologist. Um, you, some people come in when they have something of concern, but I do think it's re it's really important to be on that schedule. It depends on how close you are to your diagnosis, what type of skin cancer you had, the features of your skin cancer, but getting those regularly scheduled appointments that are head to toe lookovers because there's a lot of areas that we can't see on our body. Um, we talked about self-skin exams, but sometimes it's more difficult, um, whether it be because of physical limitations or just ability to look at, at certain areas. Um, and so that dermatologist should be looking at you from head to toe, even where sun has not been occurring on that area of the body, there still can be skin cancer. And I have definitely seen many skin cancers um, in what we call sun protected skin. The, the concept of a dermatoscope, I think, is critical. The studies have shown that it allows us to better triangulate so that we diagnose and biopsy things that are more likely to be skin cancer and, are, and we biopsy fewer things that are less likely to be skin cancer. And so it allows us to hone in on what is important for you. Um, and I think for a lot of patients that are coming on a regular basis, sometimes not biopsying everything that is on the edge is okay. Um, the idea behind that is that some things may look like a basal cell carcinoma, but it may be something inflammatory, like inflammation or hair follicle or something of that nature. And sometimes looking at that area in a few months later, and it has resolved, saves you that biopsy versus the other side is where there's something we're not really sure about, but we note it for the future. And when it still is there or it has progressed, we have that photo to look back at to allow us to make a more definitive choice about doing that biopsy. A lot of people want to be proactive and that's fantastic. And the challenge is, is that there aren't as many things that we can do from a proactive perspective, but there are critical things that we're going to talk about that I think are, are helpful and super important. So we talked about regular skin, skin exams monthly. Um, and I think that should be done in concert or in partnership with your dermatologist skin exams that we talked about that are regular. Um, and that also is helpful because some people have a lot of different spots, whether they be things that they've had for a long time or things that are newer that may be benign, and it's more difficult for them to look at their skin. That is that partnership approach with your dermatologist. We talked about sun protection. And then the final point is that there was a recent study, which is the, the link is down at the bottom, um, is that we found that a vitamin called nicotinamide can definitely help people prevent future skin cancers. Um, it's not a marked reduction, but it's definitely there. And it's a very safe medication. Um, so I think that's something to talk about with your dermatologist, um, something called nicotinamide that they found worked fairly well in a number of patients. We've talked about what does skin cancer look like? How does it come? What should you be doing? Now let's dispel some of the things that are in um, sort of society that may or may not be completely true. So I'm listing six things here. These are the preview for what we're going to talk about. Um, so the first one, and this will be totally talked about um, by my colleagues, Dr. Vitamos and Dr. Geiger, um, people think that it's just basal cell, it's just squamous cell carcinoma. Number one, we're going to see some pictures of it's not just that um, when you see the pictures from Dr. Venomous, but also with Dr. Geiger, there is a non-zero risk of death. About 2,000 people per year in the U.S. die from non-melanoma skin cancer. And so while most of the time we don't want people to be significantly psychologically affected by their recent diagnosis of basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma, we also want them to be vigilant to get it treated in a timely fashion so it doesn't lead to those things down the road. Next, people think, I only got a sunburn on my hands or on my chest. I can't get skin cancer on my leg. So while most of basal cell carcinomas are on the head and neck, where probably most of us have gotten a fair bit of sun, 25% were on areas that are typically covered. And this is why I talked about that head to toe skin exam, looking at areas like the buttocks or the armpits, 
um, where we definitely do see skin cancers. Um, scalp in, in women or men with significant amount of hair. We definitely see skin cancers there as well. Now, squamous cell carcinomas are more tightly tied to sun exposure, um, but definitely can occur, as I mentioned, in areas such as the genital region, which is more re likely related to HPV and not sun exposure. So I think that means if you see something in one of these areas where you didn't get much sun, please still come in. It is critical to get that checked. So as Dr. Funchain alluded to, genetics and inherited genetics are near and dear to my heart. Um, a lot of people think it's just sun. There's nothing else. No genetics. Not so true. Um, there are definitely some rare genetic syndromes that dramatically increase your risk for skin cancer. Basal cell nevus syndrome increases your risk for basal cells. Um, Lynch syndrome increases your risk for skin cancers. And there's some other rare conditions such as xeroderma pigmentosum, um, or Rombo syndrome, et cetera, et cetera, that do increase your risk for skin cancers as well. And more commonly, um, we have an um, inherited risk within variants in a gene called MC1R, which is related to our pigmentation. Um, people that have variants in that gene are much more likely to have red hair. And that significantly increases your risk for skin cancer. Um, and this is more of an aside to melanoma, but they definitely have some strong work um, both in um, sort of the lab-based side and the clinical side showing that independent of sunburns, having variants in MC1R can increase your risk for melanoma. So there's definitely a genetic component. And then we flip it around when we look at patients that have had a lot of basal cell carcinomas. Um, this is some nice work done out of Stanford um, where a lot of people will say, well, they've had a lot of basal cell carcinomas. That must mean that they've gotten a lot of sun. Well, yeah, but also they looked at genes related to cancer susceptibility and looked at inherited gene, inherited alterations sort of throughout every cell of the body. And they found one in five patients with that number of basal cells had um, alterations in one of those cancer susceptibility genes, which are relevant to risk for other cancers, indicating that there's probably something going on that's predisposing this individual to cancer in general. And so then they looked the other way do, are they more likely to have these internal cancers? And they were threefold more likely looking at things that you may not classically associate with basal cell carcinoma, things like hematologic malignancies or colon cancer. So there's definitely a genetic component there. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind um, when you're thinking about your previous sun exposure and how much you were doing or other people, you know, your parents were doing, some of it may just be your genetics as well. So we alluded to this at the beginning. Um, a lot of people think people with darker skin can't get skin cancer. That is false. Um, skin cancer can occur in individuals with darker skin. Um, the key thing to know in that situation, though, is we talked about primarily how skin cancer looks in people of European ancestry. Um, skin cancer um, in skin of color looks different than those descriptions that I talked about. So what I would say is if there is something that is looking different, please come in and get it checked. Um, the side point that I would say is that that relationship between sun exposure in skin cancer and skin of color is actually not particularly strong, sort of tenuous. I link some, some articles at the bottom where um, there's been a, a bunch of work looking at what that relationship truly is. Um, this is a this is a definite line that people get, and you can probably understand that after hearing a few of the other myths, that's probably not true. I haven't gotten any sun exposure since my skin cancer diagnosis. How did I get this other skin cancer? And so they this is sort of proving that sunscreen does prevent skin cancer. They looked at daily regular use of sunscreen um, in patients compared to they told people you can do whatever you want. Um, probably most of them did not wear sunscreen. Um, they did see a significant reduction of squamous cell carcinoma in those who use sunscreen. The relationship with other skin cancers was not as strong, um, but the rates were only reduced by about 40%, um, not 100%. What this means is that a lot of things from what happened before they started this trial probably came to roost, um, as well as other things that are environmental risk factors um, that were affecting them developing skin cancer at that point in time. Um, and then 
a lot of people say, well, I only, I got basal cell carcinoma. That's all I'm, what I'm going to get. They're not worried about things that look different. Um, so you can get a lot of different skin cancers. One, obviously important is melanoma because it has significant risk for, um, harming your life. Um, and those are risk of melanoma is definitely increased after a previous diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma, and basal cell carcinoma. Um, so you can definitely develop other types of skin cancer, um, probably from shared environmental and genetic risk factors. And then the final thing is that that means anything that's concerning, please come in for. You can hear a refrain, please come in, please come in. And then going back to before skin cancer developed, a lot of people have heard about what are called actinic keratoses, which are precursor lesions to squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and there's a lot of treatment involved in this, um, often seen as red scaly lesions on primarily sun-exposed areas. There's a wide variety of what the risk of transformation into squamous cell carcinoma is. Some people quote very low rates. Some people quote very high rates. Interestingly, some of them will spontaneously go away. Um, and so working with your dermatologist on that treatment is, is important for what makes sense for you. Um, oftentimes they're treated with what's called cryotherapy or liquid nitrogen therapy or freezing. And that is that works really well. But I think if people have a lot of actinic keratosis, think about field therapy, talk to your dermatologist about field therapy. It can treat a lot of them at once. But also there is some studies that show that it may reduce your, your risk of future skin cancer. And examples of field therapy where it's sort of treating the whole face, something called topical 5-fluorouracil or photodynamic therapy. Some people call it blue light or red light therapy. So to conclude, as you know, skin cancer is very common, but typically treatable. And we're going to hear about treatment in a few moments. Sunscreen is important, but other factors such as genetic risk factors also are important as well. Please work with your dermatologist um, along with your own self-skin exams, and you can help detect your subsequent skin cancers earlier um, so that the treatment can be as minimal as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arbsman. I always learn from you, and that was fantastic. A great, um, I won't say encyclopedic, but it's definitely went A to Z. 